Glenda Jones, my husband Alan and I bought this property 28 years ago. We had never lived on a woodlot. We had never had anything to do with country living. But the moment we saw this property in the fall of that year, we just knew this was where we belonged. The interesting thing about this is, years later, when we looked up my mother's um, genealogy, we found that her original family had settled in West Huntley, where we are, which made a real connect to the land. We have 20 acres total, and of that 20 acres, 18 is called ANSI land, and there's a covenant on the land. It's an area of natural and scientific interest. We are on the edge of the Burnt Lands Alvar, but our land is not really Alvar like you would see it there. This land is very, very rocky, glacial rock, very little soil. You can hardly get a shovel in anywhere, but it's a beautiful mixed forest. Um, maple, beech, pine, cherry, ironwood, ash, basswood, um, butternut, uh, spruce, hemlock, pine, all through this area. We have kept the forest just the way we found it, except we've put trails through it for our own enjoyment. So we call it the forest of evolution and observation. We have used it just for the purpose of enjoying what we have. We have taken firewood off it and we are allowed under the covenant that's on the land to do that. But with the covenant on the land, we can't put buildings on, we can't clear it off, we can't put cattle on it. Never had any intention of doing that. So this piece of property to us is forest enjoyment, and I guess the word forest bathing must come into it somewhere, although you wouldn't want to do that with the mosquitoes in the summer. <laughs> but we love it just to walk through, walk our dogs every day, morning and afternoon, and just enjoy what's here. A lot of the trees I can, well, I can identify the trees. I'm not so good at identifying the mosses, the lichens, or the ferns, but I do notice the difference that we have. And as I'm walking every day in the forest, I take a look at them and see what's there. The other thing I really love finding, in the spring, there are so many wildflowers through this whole area. And, and things you wouldn't expect, beauty just on the ground when you look down and see it. And the same in the early fall when the mushrooms are out. And it's just like another flower garden. It's red and yellow and green and it's a beautiful place to just walk through. We encourage people to come and walk through, to snowshoe, to ski. And I even let people come to walk their dogs through here because it's a wonderful place for dogs to just come and run. So to us, the forest is a joy. And we know that no one owns a forest. You, you have the forest for the time that you live here and then the next person gets to enjoy it. Our idea is to leave it as good as we can leave it so that the next people who get it can enjoy it the same way that we have enjoyed it. As we walk through the forest, it's as if the whole forest is upside down because what we're seeing underfoot three weeks ago was above us. So when you look at the ground, you see oak, you see maple, and then you see red maple, and you think, where's that tree? And if you look straight up above, indeed, you see the bare tree that three weeks ago was brilliant, brilliant red. So as we walk through the forest, you can tell what we have for a forest. But these patches of red leaves always absolutely fascinate me because you can just look up and say, oh yeah, I didn't see you before, and there you are. It's just like in the spring, we have some beautiful big cherry trees out here. But when you're walking through a forest, you don't look up, especially in terrain like this, because you're looking where your feet are supposed to be. <laughs> So you don't look up unless you stop and look up. 
So in the spring, we're walking through and suddenly you come to a big area that's just white with blossoms. And when you look up, what do you know? There's a cherry tree that, that you might have even ever seen before if you hadn't seen the white on the ground. And it's the same with these red leaves. You don't see your forest until you look up. And so to look up now, not a lot to see except tree structure, which is fascinating too, because we can see what the ice storm did in 1998, I think. We can see all sorts of things about the structure of the tree, what high winds have done, things like that. But when we look at the ground, we can see what was up there before. So it's one of the observation things that I find fascinating about this forest. I like to come out and stand and just look. Look around, see what you can see. And every day there's something new and different out here. Every day, something I might have seen before. And many days I think, where's the camera sitting on the kitchen counter, <laughs> which is too bad. <laughs> but the forest floor right now is a, a picture. It really is lovely. Where we're standing right now is the back edge of our property. And we're standing on an escarpment. This escarpment of rock runs right around our full property and is just sheer cliffs of rock down and down in terraces. Uh, when we first bought the property, we could see from the escarpment right out to Upper Dwyer Hill. Now the growth of the trees has gotten so much bigger, we can't see that far. But nonetheless, the rock formations in here terrace the way they are, make this a beautiful location. And when we first had the property, we used to come out here a lot and just sit and look and realize what a, a marvelous gift we have given ourselves by living here. And we call this Alan and Glenda's escarpment because it's really a treasured spot for us. The whole area is rock with a thin layer of um, soil on the top. It's mostly limestone, some granite. It's part of the Alvar from the Bentman, but our part of the forest is rock. Very little soil here anywhere, in fact, you can't get a shovel in. So when the trees are growing up from the bottom, the little pines and any of these little trees, we really watch them because if we don't get a lot of rain, the trees just die out. They don't have the moisture. We only have one place on the property that stays damp all year long. Otherwise, it's pretty dry up here. These rocks are enormous. This is a middle-sized rock, and you can see it. it's a pretty good size. Um, granite, very heavy to try and move, but this was dropped here by the glacier. When you find a mound of rock anywhere, as deep as you would go underneath that rock, is more rock. When we first moved here, we took the rock because we wanted to make things around the yard and we stopped doing it because we realized nobody, nobody had ever seen beneath that rock. And it seemed to us that we were disturbing nature by moving anything. So we stopped taking any of the rock from anywhere. Um, At the base of the trees, we got big patches of brown cat mushrooms that my neighbor pickled. But then, this started to happen. So what we're going to have here now is a pine forest. The little pine is doing fine, so I'm letting it just survive. We call this area the meadow. Nothing, no undergrowth here at all. The way it is now is how it was 28 years ago. The only thing I can think, there were a lot of ironwood trees in here. And apparently if you have land where cattle run and then you let it go, the ironwood trees will come up quite quickly. So all I can think is 
this must have been where the, the original owner had cattle at one point. But in the meantime, we've got oak trees and maples and all kinds of other things in here. And this area, again, in the summer, it's nearly dark in here. It's so, so treed, it's so leafy. The oak tree is a white red oak. It's a red oak. Um, and we feel that it had to have survived the Great Fire. It's one of the biggest trees in this whole area. The oak that's just ahead of us is a red oak, and it's another one that we believed had survived the fire of 1870. Uh, the trees are just so huge, and they're in such good condition, and we think that that must have also been a survivor, because it's one of the two biggest trees on the property. During the ice storm, it lost three big, big branches that we had to have arborists come in and cut off for us because they were just hanging. But the tree's been healthy. At one point, it got a fungus that I treated with um, mild bleach, got rid of it. It was a host last year for the uh, gypsy moth in a very, very big way. And in fact, you can still see cocoons in places hanging on it. But last year, this tree was completely denuded of all its spring leaves. They came back out in the middle of July and the tree looked like a brand new tree. Now this year, it's been totally healthy, but no acorns at all on any of the oaks, nor have we had seeds on the maples. And I've not seen many beech nuts. The same thing, the beech trees were badly hit. But it was very sad to see this last year and not have any leaves on it. It was very glad to see it this year and know it had survived. Uh, we would be absolutely bereft if anything happened to that gorgeous tree. Um, this is a butternut tree. We get a big charge out of this tree because it gets its leaves last in the spring and drops them first in the fall, which makes for a real nice nest. Uh, it's a a fascinating tree because it's so big and it's lasted so long. We've been on this property for 28 years and when we moved here this tree was six feet tall. It was a small tree and we didn't really realize the significance of it until we realized in other areas of our property the butternuts were dying. So we've always been careful about this tree, not that there's much we can do to, to preserve it or help it but we've always been mindful of the condition of the bark and um, what branches are dying on it. And there are a lot dying on it. So the tree probably is coming to the end of its life. But even now, as we've been standing here, we've discovered a little tiny yellow fungus. What that tree? We thought it was a leaf, but nope, that's a little fungus. Uh, this ironwood is a real specimen tree. It's probably one of the biggest ironwoods you would see in this area. Uh, it's quite fascinating because there are several holes in it as you go up the tree. And squirrels live in the holes some years and we'll see the babies coming out from the top, which is kind of fun to see. But the tree is healthy, although it is growing practically on sheer rock. The roots go left and right and down a bit so that it does have growth. But we really look after this tree because it is one of the biggest ironwoods around here. This tree was one of our first major finds right here. We call it the harp tree and you can see why. It's a beech. But how did this tree grow? It appears to have come from one point at the bottom. So what did it do? Did it grow up and graft in? Did that branch come out and go down in and root? We have no idea. But this tree to me is a beautiful specimen 
of what can happen in nature when you least expect it. And the tree is growing, it's uh, thriving. This part seems to be rotting a bit, but we're just leaving it alone because that is the beauty. So that's one of my favorite, favorite trees out here. And three summers ago, these started down, one after the other after the other, just almost in a line. So we tend the ones that were dead and decided that we would just keep our eye on them. No leaves at all the next year. After that, as we looked across, there were more, there were more, there were more. You can see a big one up in there that's broken off. And you can see dead leaves at the very top. So in, like this year, that tree has died. There's another one closer, it's died. There's one at the back, it's died. On the other hand, we've got smaller ones now starting to come up. They're getting more light and they're starting to come up. In the summer, this area is almost dark to walk through because of the trees. And the temperature in here will be several degrees cooler than what we have up at the house. Um, so it's an interesting little area and I'm happy to see the trees coming like this and I'm also finding it interesting because these are all beaches. Some are green, some are yellow, and some are brown. But to me they look like they're all healthy. There are no holes in the leaves. The leaves aren't patchy. The bark on the little trees is in good condition. So my hope is that as more sun gets in here, these trees are going to come up and survive. If others die, then maybe new ones will come in. We also had a lot of spruces in this area, and they died probably 20 years ago. Again, one after the other after the other. They would just turn brown and they'd be gone. So all we could do was take them down. And when you took them down, the root was totally rotted. There was nothing there. You could just push them over. So obviously, um, it was something that was killing them at the root. Uh, we do have the Ministry of Natural Resources come out every once in a while when we want something identified, like what was killing the spruce trees, what was killing the, the beech trees. And quite often, our own observations are enough to tell us and them what's going on. So when we see fungus at the bottom, and we see the roots just rotted off, you know then that's a root fungus that's gotten in there and killed them. Uh, they did advise us when we see them dead like that to take them down, which pleases me because I don't like seeing standing dead things. <laughs> Underneath the spruces, not new spruces, but there are some ash trees coming in places. There are uh, some butternuts, not a lot, but we do have ash trees coming and I'm really happy about that. Some maples, but not in this area. This really is pretty well beech and it's the beech trees that are coming back up. Um, the undergrowth is bracken in this area, bracken and ferns. Um, some ground cover type fern and there are some little pine trees coming up. It's kind of hard to identify them now if the leaves have come off because you're looking at a stick. <laughs> so it's hard to know if they're a birch or just what. This area is very, very green all summer long with sedges and uh, brackens and ferns all through here. So when you walk through here in the winter, you have these little bits of sort of glistening leaves everywhere. rock has, has moss and several different kinds of lichens on it. See the layers in there. Okay? You can see all the mm -hmm. strata in it. We have slowly made trails through the woods and we now have nine connecting trails out here and we have them all named so they're all very precious to us. 
But one reason that we named them was so that when we're out looking at things and trying to identify stuff, we can say it was on Belle's Choice. It was on Bonnie's Byway. And the trails are all named after our family and our pets. So we didn't have to go far to find names. It is a big task. There are 18 acres and nine trails that we have to maintain. But just daily walking through all the trails, if you just do a little bit every day, then the trails stay usable. And it's, it's great any season of the year to come out here and see what the trails look like. Right now, you could look and practically not see a trail at all. But we've been out here so much that we know exactly. And if we don't know, the dogs know, so it's all good. When there are hollows between the rocks, we do fill that up with branches from cleaning up the woods. We've tried to keep the underbrush as low as we can, uh, just to keep it cleaned up. And when the, the brush is piled in a heap, it's homes for little animals, for mice, and then you get the owls. So it's, it's payback one way and the other. Um, we do try and pile things in an orderly fashion so that you can walk through the woods anywhere and not have to think you're going to fall and trip on something. We've made trails all through, but there were many places where the, the rocks were just in heaps and you couldn't get through. And certainly you couldn't bring the tractor, the little tractor through. So we, we cleared this out and we moved these rocks. And when I walk through here now, I just marvel that we even did it. When we had the Direco storm in May, we had a lot of trees snap off. And this area was badly, badly hit. We had a couple of big maples come down. We had tops come off of, of dead beech trees. We had beech trees come down. And quite frankly, this is an area that I come out and look at and despair about cleaning up. Uh, there was so much good wood that we were able to take, which of course is a bargain because that's the only way we can take wood off this property is if it's down or it's dead because of the covenant that's on the land. But you can see that stuff is just having to be left. So I'm hoping that when the leaves come off the trees, it sort of hides the mess. Or I'm very tempted to get out here and clean up. And that isn't, that makes no sense. This will die down, it will rot away, and that's what we want. We want it just to go back into the earth the way it was. But it's disheartening when you come out after a storm and you try and walk through your forest and you find so many trees down, especially trees that you had noted before and really liked. And I know there are a lot of trees out here, but there are some that I look at and they're really, really special. And I think, oh, if that tree comes down, I would feel bad. And one of the ones that did come down was a big, big maple. And I had really, that was a tree I had really loved. So this is the remains, but in the meantime, we have a lot of fire with out of it. So it, it fuels us one way or the other, other, either by looking at it when it's alive or keeping us warm in the winter. So it's a trade-off and uh, we love it. But when I see it de just demolished like this, I do feel really, really bad. This is one of the big trees. This one came down and took the, the root that's over there, uh, came down this direction and uh, then part of it broke off and fell behind us and part of it came off over this way. So it took two or three trees down with it. But as you can see, that was a very big tree and it was a healthy tree. There was nothing wrong with it. Um, it just came over. But look how it came out of the ground and it even brought the rocks out with it. And those rocks, you couldn't pry those rocks out of it. So the tree held on as best it could and then just came over. But we've left the root as testament to what the tree was. And there it is. One of the first trees that, that our son cut down. And uh, he, he knew what he was doing. He's an engineer, he does know what he's doing. And he was very, very careful. 
when he was cutting it. So he cut and he cut and he cut, and we were sure it was going to fall right down that path. No, 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 it fell right down between there. It was a terrible job to get that in. So we've left the stump as just the example of tree cutting, sometimes not quite what you want. That was a huge piece of wood. It came down and it didn't fall. So we started and we cut and cut and cut. There was still one piece hanging there, just hanging. It's oak, so hard, hard wood. It hung there for a full year and it finally broke. And look how it broke. And we've got, we got a box of kindling off this tree. You, you can see how it just comes off. So watching it come down was really fascinating. And we didn't touch it for fear that touching it would drop it. And if it had, it was so big, it would have been really dangerous. So we just, we left it to see what was going to happen. And that's part of the observation what is going to happen. And it's fascinating to find out what is going to happen. This wood pile is part of the wood we've collected for the winter and mercifully my son comes out and helps with the splitting so I don't have to do that by myself. But on September 24th I went to take the women's chainsaw course. It was the most fun I've had in a day. It was empowering. It was exciting. It was interesting. I bought my own saw from a lovely woman at Rental Village in Carlton Place. Her name is Karen. I would recommend her to anybody. Uh, she got me exactly what I needed. And I went off to the course just so delighted and came away after a day with Frank Nappy and seven other women who had not ever cut down trees and limbed things. Uh, and I came home very confident of what I could do, went out the next day with my trusty little saw and sawed down a couple of trees that I wanted, that were leaning, that I wanted down, limbed a whole bunch of stuff. And the next weekend, my son, who does help me with the, the uh, splitting, he came out and we went to the woods with the two chainsaws and we accomplished in a morning what would have taken us normally one full day to do. And I found it really, really satisfying. So my next thing is to take the felling course and I can hardly wait. <laughs> it's going to really, really be fun. Uh, I've written up a little experience that I had at the Chainsaw course. It's going to be in the November issue of The Hum, the arts and entertainment newspaper in Elmont. And it's available online so you can see what i look like when i'm a lumberjack not dressed up 